We are still on our main team, on our sub team, which we treated on Sunday with a head in one of the good news concerning the Christian life. Someone might say, What has this got to do with me? Information is so important to the life of everyone in Christ. Not even to the life of everyone in Christ, even to the life of every one of God's creation. Information is so important, is so crucial. That's what I would say, for lack of the information of his word, his people perish. In the same way, for lack of the information of the things of this world, you are not able to function as you ought to function. Last Sunday morning, we were deliberating on one of the good news concerning the Christian life on earth. And I said this good news is our exemptions. It's, our, it's the fact that we have been exonerated. We have been set apart from all the forms of mortal liabilities that is associated with this earthly domain of God's universe, which is the earth. We are set apart, everyone in Christ. Until you begin to understand this truth, you can walk the God life. We are set apart from all forms of mortal liabilities. This whole earth is a mortal world. Every life here is in the mortal realm. And when you talk about mortal, that means something that has an end. It has begun, it has an end. Because of Christ, we are now enrolled into this life of immortality. Only that we are waiting for the coming of Christ, our Lord and Savior, for the final consummation of the same. So Bible says in the book of Romans 8, the verse 2, that for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That means there's a law that governs the spirit life that we have in Christ Jesus. The life we have in Christ now is not the life of the senses. It's not the life that we live by, what we see or what we feel or what we touch. That's the life of the senses. And this life is in the realm of mortal life. But we live by the law of the spirit of life that is found in Christ Jesus. And he said, this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that's at work in us has exonerated that it has set you and me apart and pushed us over any form of mortal liability on this earth. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, there's a law that rules the spirit life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Of which life we are a part. There's a law ruling your life now because your life you have now is not your natural life. It's a life that has been parted into you by the Spirit of God, which is called eternal life. When you talk about eternal life, people are thinking that when we live here and we go to heaven, it's, it it's transcends beyond that. It begins from now. When you begin to understand that eternal life is a life of immortality, a life that has been robed robbed you into a place that you will not see taste of death. You see, the problem with many of us is when Bible talks about death, the first thing that comes to our mind is the physical death. Physical death actually is the least spoken of in the Bible because it's, the physical death is a, a platform or a realm of transition. As long as Christ tarries, uh, if your time is you, you will live. But then there's a second death, which the Bible calls death, which the Bible refers to, to be eternally separated from God or to be left in eternal damnation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So there is a law that governs or rules the life that we have in Christ Jesus. We don't have an ordinary life. In the same way, the Bible says there is a law that rules the realm of life of sin and death, which is this mortal world. There's the life that rules the realm of the life of sin and death. And the mortal world is found in this domain of life. Which life, I said on Sunday, is full of the controls from the demonic world. If you live in this mortal world, you are under, you'll be under the control of the powers of darkness and demonic forces. It's also a life, the mortal life is also a life of liabilities. And tonight, as God grants me grace, I will explain just in a short, about two or three sentences, what liabilities mean. It's a life full of liabilities, a life full of dangers. That's what I want to say. They are full of dangers. The mortal life is full of dangers. And I mean this, mortal life is controlled by the law of sin and death. 
And the Bible makes it clear that everyone in Christ has been enrolled into this spirit life found only in Jesus Christ. And that such individuals, we those who are enrolled into this new found faith in Christ, the life of the spirit, he said we are excused or we are disassociated from this life of sin and death. That has to do with the mortal life and the mortal realm. It is the presence of the Lord Jesus always with us through the Holy Spirit indwelling us that confirms and establishes this life of immortality. It is the presence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit that confirms and establishes our life of immortality found in Christ Jesus, which is also known as our life, the life of spirits. The life of the spirits. Hallelujah. No wonder the Bible says the Holy Spirit was given to us as a seal for the day of our final adoption into eternity with God. Hallelujah. To hear, that is life, the life we have in Christ is a life that translates us from being mortals into immortals. It's a good news. It's a good news. If you actually understand what an immortal life is and you understand what a mortal life means, it will tell you that it's really one of the good news that we can ever have. The immortal life is a life that reigns over sin. I said on Sunday, when you have an immortal life, not the mortal life, the mortal life dwells in the domain of sin. So that means the immortal life reigns over the mortal life because sin is found in the mortal domain of the mortal and the mortal life. So more, the immortal life is a life that reigns over sin. It's a life that reigns over weakness and sickness and pains. It reigns over frustrations. It reigns over stagnations and it reigns also over anxieties. Why many, many people are so anxious in life is because they are subject to this rule of the law of the mortal life, the law of sin and death. Anytime you are subject to fear, you are subject to anxiety, you are subject to all these things, that means... The law that is governing this, the world of sin and death is at work in you. Then someone may ask, hey, then pastor, what can we do now? Yes. It is your confidence in what God has said concerning your life now in Christ that will put you over the situations. That's why we say fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith now, not a fight against the devil. If you say Satan, I cast you down 20 times and times and you don't know your privilege or your rightful position in Christ, you will say that and you will die. Satan will still keep on hitting you. Hallelujah. Because the language Satan understands is power. And power is invested in the faith, faith in God's word. What I mean to say, power is invested in your confidence in God's word. When you come to understand the same and you live by the same and you act by the same, Satan leaves you and he goes away and comes once in a while to see whether you can have his way through. Praise the Lord. The immortal life reigns over all the forces of darkness, including Satan. That's why he said, I give you power over serpents and over scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That Not all the powers, all the power of the enemy. That nothing by any means will hurt you. This is what the Bible says concerning our life. Because of the immortal life, it reigns also over all forms of deaths including both the physical and spiritual death. You know, there's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. And the immortal life reigns over both. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the chapter 15, the verse 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood. He said it can never inherit the kingdom of God. Neither can corruption inherit corruption. That's, that means uh, our physical life that we have now, it can never transcend that into the life that God wants us to live with him in eternity. Because the life that man possesses now by virtue of our Adamic nature is a life of corruption. And if you live by the life of the mortal man, then, then that means you are living by flesh and blood. He said the life of the flesh is in the blood. But our life now is not determined by our flesh and blood. Our life now is determined by the spirit of life. It's a higher order of life. That's what eternal life means. So when Jesus Christ said, you shall have eternal life, you know, many, many people have not come to understand. 
It's a life of the spirit. It's an immortal life. A life that has the forces and power of God embedded in it that can transcend between this mortal world. So it says, the flesh and blood, flesh and blood in 1 Corinthians 15, 15, it says it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So that means if you live the mortal life, you cannot, you cannot live with God in eternity. That's what the Bible says here. It says, neither can corruption inherit in corruption. In the verse 53 of Isaiah, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the verse 53 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the same book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the, in the verse 53 says, the Bible says, for this corruptible life. That means the immortal, the mortal life is corruptible. He said, for this corruptible life must put on incorruption. And this mortal life must put on what? Immortality. He said, for this corruptible life must put on what? Incorruption. And this mortal life must put on immortality. That is why it is hard for corruption to cease upon this earth. Corruption is not only the things that the government and the people of the world Corruption is also part of the decadence, the life that we find ourselves, the decay that we find ourselves in. That everything dies around you. You see, that when you put on this stress, you can't put it forever. You know that. It will come to a time, either it becomes smaller for you, or it fades away, or it becomes what? Tatted. That's corruption. The shoe I wear now, I can't wear it forever. It will come to a time, either the shoe will be so tight on me, or the shoe will be so old, or his fashion nature will be what? Will be off from the system. That's the reason why today there's this hairdo, tomorrow there's that hairdo. Corruption has bought all those things. Today they said this style is there, next time they said this style is not there. Now we are wearing trying that ties out from there to us, showing every cleavage. That's corruption. You wait before that thing was there a long time and it went away and it has come back. That's why the Bible says there's nothing new on this planet. There's so much corruption. Praise the Lord. So he said when it comes to our final consummation to be with Christ, every form of corruption will be subject to the life of incorruption that we are going to finally inherit, which is the life of what? Immortality. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the verses 4, the Bible says, For we are in this tabernacle, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan. 2 Corinthians 5, 4. Being burdened, not that we will be unclothed, but clothed upon. Not that we will take out this nature of, he said, but clothed upon. For we that are in this tabernacle do grow and being burdened, not that we will be unclothed. He's talking about this mortal nature. Not that we want to put it away. But it says, there's so much power in the immortal nature that when it comes to clothe you, the mortal body will be what? Will extinguish. I love this. That's why I tell that, look, a life of immortality overpowers or is superior to a life of the mortal. Say, so not that we are, for we that are in this tabernacle do grow. He's talking about this earthly body of our domain, of, 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 of earthly body that our spirit dwells in. He says, we do groan, being burdened, not that this body should leave us now because we are in this physical world. It should be there for us to be able to relate with the human beings. That's why this body is there, although it belongs to the mortal world, but we have it now on because of what? Because of our relationship with the physical world. Because right now, if this mortal body is taken away and then you are given a spiritual body, like I stand and talk, you can't see me. You can't touch me. So right now, as we are on this planet, God is dealing with our spirits. Our spirit has become what? Immortal. And if your spirit has become immortal, that means your spirit should control your whole system. So it's about being clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So when Jesus comes, this earthly tabernacle will be taken away and then will be clothed. And what he's saying here is that, you know, during the time of the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, those who were not dead and are still alive, all of a sudden, Bible says in the twinkling of our eye, you will change. Your earthly tabernacle will be changed because the earthly, the heavenly 
immortal clothing that Christ has purchased for you on the cross. It has to come on you suddenly. When it comes on you, then the mortal body distinguishes. So, I mean, extinguishes. Then you remain what? With a, what? With a mortal, an immortal body before you can be able to do what? Lift up. Right now, can you be lifted up? No. So before, when you are alive, when Jesus Christ comes, that's why he's trying to tell us that when you stand like this, you need to change before you can be what? Lifted up. But those who are dead, they will also be changed from where they are and every one of us will be lifted up. And they will take the lead first before those of us who are alive. I don't want to be alive if the years are going to be long now. So before those of you who are alive, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, not until we have this understanding of God as God's beloved one, that we have been enrolled into a life of immortality, we cannot live the conqueror that we are asked to live here on earth. The Bible says that any one of us that is born of God overcomes the world. We know that, First John 5, 4. It says, if you are born of God, you have overcome this world. And this scripture is simply saying that the seed of immortality has already been sown in the life of everyone that confesses and accepts the Lordship of Jesus Christ over their lives. Otherwise, we cannot overcome this world. Most of us don't want to put on our new nature. That's why we are not overcoming this world. Anytime you get yourself roped in the new nature, you overcome this world. When you be a, and you can't get roped until you have understand that you have a new robe. Until you understand that you are enrolled into a new life of immortality. You can you know, hear me, many Christians say, you know, you see, we are just mortal men. You are just, you know, that shows you the extent of their understanding when it comes to the gospel. You know, we are just like, but you're aware because you go to something and see that. You know, we are all fallible. You hear those Christians say that. You know, we are fallible. Really, you are saying it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that means you are just telling God, God, your salvation you gave to me is going to work. Hallelujah. Amen. It's not going to work. So we are still fallible. But meanwhile, Jesus, according to scripture, he said that the new life, the life of the spirit has now been patterned to you. You say it's going to work. Because if you say you are fallible, that means you are living a life of what? The flesh and blood. It's flesh and blood that is prone to fallibility. It means it's limited. We are not limited, brothers and sisters. It's our mentality that is limiting us in this faith life. None of us is limited. No. All things are possible to them that believe. That tells you that and me that we have gone beyond that life of limitation. So if you say, oh, we are just, you know, we are just human, we are just fallible. You are telling God that, oh, oh, you are just telling God, I don't believe what you have said. Your word doesn't work in me. Though you said I'm infallible, but I want you to, you to know that I'm fallible because I, I, I desire and I've chosen to be fallible, to fall and get up. Amen. Hallelujah. To do the things that are in this natural world. So in, in, final, in the final analysis, you can throw me where you want to throw me into. You are not fallible. It's the worst of this world. Yes, they are fallible. We can understand. But we have chosen to speak like the way they speak. And Bible says we should not say a confederacy where the people are saying a confederacy. He said the thing that the people, well, the world people are saying, we should not say them. But he said we should set God apart, sanctify the Lord of hosts. He said, let holy him, his word be your dread. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Anyone born of God has overcome the world and its in, intended deadly life. The mortal life is a deadly life. And in Christ Jesus, we have overcome all. And I mean all that surrounds the mortal life and the physical domain of God's universe, which is the earth, full of sin and of full of death in Christ. We have overcome this earthly or mortal life until you begin to believe this, you are not going to overcome it. You have overcome weakness, sickness. You have overcome it. Not that you shall, you have. Praise the Lord. Some of you are looking at me with stared eyes. Pastor, what are you saying? That is what God is saying. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All that surrounds the mortal life and this physical domain of God's universe, which is the earth full of sin and death in Christ, we have overcome this early and mortal life. And that's what God wants us to know. When we talk about sin, we are referring to wickedness. And we have, we have overcome wickedness. When we talk about sin, we are, we are talking about iniquity. We are talking about injustice. 
We are talking about crimes. We are talking about depravity. We are talking about immorality, corruption, dishonesty, debauchery, etc. As a result of forsaking God's word, that's why people begin to live in sin. So when you put God's word aside, you live in sin. So if God says you have been born into a life of the spirit, and you say, no, I am fallible, then you are going to live in what? In sin and death. Because you are telling him he's lying. And Bible says, let every man be a liar, but let God be truth. The faith life is become actually a bane of this dispensation of grace for many Christians, the faith life. It's difficult to comprehend it. Because it's not the life of the senses. No, no, it's not the life of the senses. So if you stand and you want to preach the life of the senses, oh, you'll get many people listening to you. Right now, as I'm saying, many people, they will even pick it on and say, what is he talking about? Put it aside. But let me start talking in the realms of the senses. You see many, oh, oh, oh he's saying, oh, come, bakwasem. What's that bakwasem? Praise the Lord. Oh, come, bakwasem, oh, kasao. And there's no element of truth. You know, there's a difference between truth and facts. What the fellow might be saying might be facts, but you see, God does not deal with facts. God deals with the truth because he dwells in the realm of truth. And I'm talking about reality. So what does he say? Is it a real thing? Is it the way God sees it? Is it something that is in line with what God says? That's what we need to measure as children of God. Anytime we hear any communicate, we come across any communicate or any information, we measure it with the word of God. Or that we will live in this mortal world and it's going to be hectic for us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All the vice associated with sin has its repercussions or consequences on man's destiny here on earth and the world to come. And the repercussion of sin is death. The repercussion of sin is death. And when the Bible talks about death, it's not much in terms of the physical death, which is a departure from this earth. And this is very normal. Very normal for everyone if you, the, for, for transition. When the Bible talks about death, it's rather referring to lack and want, things like a disease and infirmity, anguish and sorrow, unrest in the inner man, spiritual separation from God on earth, which might even lead you to eternal separation. So when God is talk, the Bible talks about death, he's meaning these things. It's not a physical death. So as long as you are outside of Christ Jesus, outside of Christ Jesus, all these social and spiritual Spiritual ills or difficulties is bound to overtake you. It is bound to rule you. And it's finally bound to ruin you. I said, as long as you are outside of Christ, the social and spiritual ills or difficulties I just mentioned, the Lord that governs sin and death, it will overtake you. It will rule you, R-U-L-E. It will rule over you. And finally, it will ruin, R-U-I-N. It will ruin your destiny. This is the power sin has over every mortal man that lives on this physical domain of God's universe called earth. And this trend began when the first Adam transgressed. The moment Father Adam transgressed, the power of sin began working. And Bible says sin and death began working from Adam to what? Christ, when Christ came, that it was abolished. But until then, sin and death reign over all. And right now, even that the sin and death is abolished, it is a choice. You choose to take advantage of the abolishment of sin and death, or you choose to allow it to function your life. It's your prerogative right. And the foundation is just to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. And building over it is your confidence in what God has said and you walk in accordance with his way. That's all. If you want to walk in another way, that's your own challenge. God doesn't have a problem. Praise the Lord. So although sin and death has been abolished when Jesus introduced the new life, which is the life of spirit and life, but many have chosen to still hold on to romance with the life of sin and death. And there's nothing God is going to do about it because we are free moral agents. He's going to put pressure on you. You keep on living in the final day. He's a judgment. And you're going to meet him. You know, many people don't believe that there will be judgment day. It's going, to, it's going to be wild. There will be judgment day. I'm not scaring anybody, but let me let you know. If ever I don't have the opportunity to tell there will be judgment day, I want you to know it now. So I'm 
God does not hold me responsible one day. There will be judgment day. Listen to me. Father, you are listening to me. The host of heaven, you are listening to me. All the angels in heaven, you are listening to me. There will be judgment day. Take it or leave it. This is one of the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of our redemptive nature in Christ, and as well as our justification, the presence of God, we have a new life. Take it or leave it. I said this is one of the realities of the gospel. This is one of the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of our redemptive nature in Christ and as well as our justification in the presence of God. We are now being justified. We have a new law, which is the spirit life at work in our life and as well as in our bodies. Not only is this new life, the spirit life working in our heart, in our lives, it's also working in what? In our bodies. Not only in our spirits. He said, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the grave, what? Dwells in you. That same spirit will do what? Will give life to your mortal body or will quicken your mortal body. So this life we have in Christ now, not only works in our spirit, it works within our body also. Praise the Lord. Every Christian has therefore been exempted or relieved from all the ills. That has to do with man on this earth. And not only that, but power has also been granted us to prevail over all these ills. Supposing God doesn't allow this spirit life to be able to work in your body, then we can sickness out to be what? An inevitable thing that we need to live with. That's why we can overcome sickness. Is somebody there? I didn't hear me. You are looking at me this way. That is the reality. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mine is to give you the information. Yours is to decide. Praise the Lord. Whether you want to live by it or you don't want to live by it, God does the same. He plays by the same principle and rule. He is to give you information. He told us, I give you this day life and death. But I recommend that you choose life, that you and your children will live. So it is yours to make a choice. But I give you the information. Praise the Lord. Every one of us have been relieved. Everyone, if through you have confessed the lordship of Jesus, you have been brought out of every form of darkness. Not only so, you have been enrolled into a life of immortality. A life that is superior to a mortal life. A life that reigns and governs this ecophysical department of God's universe and gives you, makes you a conqueror and makes you a victorious person. First John 5, the verse 4 to 5 says it. Look, to have a full import on, on, on what I'm deliberating on, you need to understand what mortal is and what are liabilities. If we understand the meaning of these words, it will help us appreciate what the Bible is trying to convey to us concerning our new life in Christ. When it says something, when they say something is mortal, this is what it simple means, one. When they say something is mortal, it means anything or a living being that is subject to death and will not live again, not even after the five judgment day of God. That's what is called mortal. Anything or any living being that is subject to death is subject to final extinction from this self and from the world and will not live again, nor even after the final judgment of God. Two, when something is considered to be mortal, it, is, it also means that that thing is liable to cause death. And I told you, when we talk about death, it's not talking about physical death. And I gave you a typical example that, look, this dress, clothes that we wear, everything here is subject to our death. And I told you that either this thing becomes too small for you to wear or it fades away or the design of it or the fashion of it is gone off or it gets torn. Praise the Lord. So in a nutshell, when we talk about mortal, we are referring to beings and things that are subject to eternal death. It is also a life associated to this earth. A, a finite life. A restricted or a limited life. That's what mortal means. The mortal life refers to things that are subject to eternal death. It is also a life associated to this earth. A finite life. A restricted life or a limited life. So all humans born in the order of Adam and most living creatures are living creatures 
are considered mortal, meaning they have a limited lifespan. They are restricted in life and will eventually pass away even after the final judgment seat of God, when God's final message will be on display. You know, the final judgment seat of God is when God's final judgment will be on display. But some are not going to experience that message of God. That should tell you what the extent of what mortal life means. So the concept of mortality is often associated with the fragility. When they say something is mortal, that means it's fragile. It's, it, it, it talks about crumbleness or the instability of life and the inevitability or the certainty of death. Or what can rightly be referred to as the certainty of the final damnation of all things that God created and did not stay in line with his precept whilst alive on this earth. So when you see that you are not staying in line with what God have, God's precepts and his counsel for your life, know that you are channeling your life in the cause of mortality. Know that you are associating your life to this life of fragility, fragility, fragility or the life of crumbleness. Your life is going to crumble. Your life will be instable. And inevitably or certainly your life will tow in the line of death. Or what can rightly be referred as the, the final damnation of all things that God created and did not stay in line with the precepts, with his precepts whilst you live on earth. When you don't stay in line with it, then know that you are on your way to mortal destination. Everyone that refuses to hearken to the voice of God, whether you are a child of God or you are an unbeliever, as long as you live outside of the principles of the word of God, you are channeling your life on the pathways of mortality. The pathway of death. The pathway to be crumbled in life journey. The pathway to live a very instable life. Unstable life. Your life will be very unstable. And your life will certainly be heading towards nothing but death. And I mean it, eternal damnation from God. Praise the Lord. All life on this earth is subject to mortal life. Every life we live here is subject to mortal life. Because this earth, as it stands now, will one day be replaced with a, a better earth. According to Isaiah 65, 17. He said, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. The mortal life is a peril between the day of one's birth and the day of his or her death. But the choices we make, I'm saying the mortal life, is the peril between the day of one's birth into this world and the day of your departure from this world. But the choices we make during the mortal life, especially the choice to follow Christ Jesus, determines our eternal destiny. What I'm trying to say, the moment they bring you forth now, since the day Adam sinned, anyone that was born, you begin a mortal life. Anyone that was born begins a mortal life. That means you begin a life of sin and death. Because the Bible says, the life of sin and death or death reigned from Adam till when Christ came that sin and death was abolished. Death was abolished. But anyone that was born until you come to a place where you confess the Lordship of Jesus and believe that he died for you and you become born again. And not only becoming born again, but you live in accordance to his, the precepts of his word. The choice you make will not translate you from this mortal life into the immortal life. Here, even on earth, is a choice we make. Praise the Lord. Everyone that is born onto this planet Earth has a mortal life. But we choose by virtue of our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the confession of his Lordship of our life and our willingness to live for him. Our willingness to live in accordance to his word. That's why will keep us on that pathway of what? Immortality. Otherwise, Although we say we have confessed the Lordship of Jesus, we still live in the life of what? Of mortality. You know, some, some people have some doctrine that, oh, you know, as, as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you just live in a house, you go to heaven. My goodness, that's love distraction information. Bible says the Old Testament was meant for us to observe and for our example. And there was something that was said in the Old Testament. In the New Testament. It says, in the Old Testament, all the people were under what? The pillar of cloud. 
by day and the pillar of fire by night. He said, but not every one of them entered into what? The promised land. That means the power of God was made available for every Israelite that left Egypt. No one of them was exempted. Every one of them had the power of God at work in their life. My Bible says it's not every one of them that allowed that power of God to work to bring them into Canaan land. He said, what? Because of their unbelief. He said, the way they hear, they did not mix it with faith. She said, let it be an example. And I like what the Bible says. She said, the foundation of the, 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 the world is sure. The foundation of the Lord, excuse me, is sure. He said, having this seal. The foundation God has laid, he says, sure. He says, so if you say you are the child of God, let anyone that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Praise the Lord. But along the line, the reason why most of us fall is because of the kinds of friends we take along the line. We make friendship with the world. We make friendship with people who are of the world and want, uh, are in this world. And then we choose out of our own free will. We don't want to have information that governs our new life. We throw them away. Then we take other information that will not help us in our Christian life. We hold on to them and we think they are those that keep us. But those, they are those that bring us into a life of mortal, mortality and kills us at the end of it. So it's the friends we take, the choices we make, the information we gather, the places that will determine the places we go, and then it will ruin us. Hallelujah. You see, right now, the devil will make you think, oh, nothing is strong, you know, and he'll make you think, but what is strong? So what about, does it mean that God is going to send all these places, especially if you go to a domain where majority of the people are living in sin or they are having an orgy, and say, so does it mean God is going to kill all these people? Oh, no, God can be so wicked. Well, he's not a wicked God, but he's a God of justice, you should know. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A sister once told me, he said, look, pastor, so you want to say, he mentioned a religion, you want to say that, so all these ones, some of them are very good and pious. Pastor, you want to say that all of them, God will put them into hell? I said, okay, I'm not the judge. God says that, Jesus is the way. He says she has said that. She's a Christian. He is the truth. He is the life. And he said, no one can come to the Father but him. They say, yes, she understands all that. But you know, you know, our good deeds also will send you to heaven. I say, you have crossed the carpet. I say, you have crossed the carpet. You, you want to learn something? Otherwise, I'll start talking to you because the very foundation that you are treading on now that we want to talk on is the very foundation you are destroying. I say, if your good works will send you to heaven, then you better, why should Jesus come? We leave our good works and we'll go. Then he says, so if you go to Israel and you die, then won't you go to heaven? Just yes, I want you to go to Mecca. You know what he was trying to say? Won't you go to heaven? I said, well, you are saying it. I open some scriptures and I say, you read it. Read it. So now you make your choice. I can't tell you anything. But this is what I know. Praise the Lord. Satan will bring you into that place. She sat down and listened to certain arguments. It looks very appealing, you know. With regards to the love of God perverted. And she went further and said, oh, Pastor, you know, one thing about you Pentecostal is that, I said, hey, say, you know, when people have piercing and they have uh, tattoos and they are homosexuals and they come to you, you shine them. I said, who told you? Though? Nobody shines anybody. They said, oh, so, I said, let me tell you something. Nobody drives away somebody who has tattoos or has piercing or is a homosexual. But if that fellow should come for a longer period of time, he's still doing more tattoos, that means he, cons he, he will consider him not to be a believer. He's still doing more what? More piercing. He doesn't. He's still living in what? In that homosexual life. Then what do you want to tell me? Because the Bible says that a new life have you been given. He said, when Jesus died, we died with him. When he was raised from the dead, we were raised with him into the newness of life. So, it's because of your tattoos that Jesus came. It's because of your piercing that Jesus came. Because of your homosexual, your dishonesty, your immoral action. You name them, that life of sin and death. That's why Jesus came. So, if Jesus came to save you and you are still living that same, then what was the essence of his coming? Then what is the power that he brought to bear in the new life? Where is that power? That means there was no power given to us. And so now we are saying that God is a liar. And that can't be so. 
The way is the essence of writing the Bible that he that is born of God overcomes the world. It doesn't work. You know, all those things are set employers to push certain information into your heart. He brings it into your mind. He pushes it into your heart. So when you begin to believe that now, you begin to live, you don't care. Whatever they say, you get angry. You want to live the way you want to live. Fine. I mean, I care for those who like argue with people when they are, want to live anyhow. You tell them and they want to, they get, and they want to, you leave them. You tell them what you leave them to go. God says, when you have told them the truth, their blood will be required of them and they will die in their sin. Their blood will be required. But it's only if you don't tell them the truth, that's when they will die in their sin, but their blood will be required of you. So you don't argue with such people because Satan has taken hold of them. Praise the Lord. As much as I want to help them, we don't argue with them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So nobody is telling someone that be straight before you come to the Lord. But when you come to the Lord, you'll be what? Straight. Is that not it? Then they come in, there's no purpose for why you came to the Lord. If you think the way you are living was okay, then why do you come to the Lord? It's because you looked at yourself and found out that, look, this life that you are living is not worth living. It's not going to benefit you. It's not going to send you anywhere. Then you begin to say, no, you want a change. Then you came to Jesus. So why do you now come to Jesus and you want to live the same way? That means you are making mockery of the cross. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And Bible says there's no longer any sacrifice that is left except the sacrifice that was made on the cross. There's no more sacrifice. Praise the Lord. That God has to give for any wrongs that we live except the sacrifice that was made on the cross. So whatever you do, you have to come back to the same place. In Christ, we need to live and be victorious. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, in talking to Martha in the book of John 11, 23, 26, referred to an identity, was trying to identify with anyone that believes in him with a life of immortality. And in John chapter 11, 23, 26, he said, to Martha, he said unto Martha, your brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, John 11, 23, 26, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe you, thou this. It was a high saying. So Jesus said unto I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet he, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He so said, do you believe in this? So Jesus was identifying with anyone that believes in him with the life of immortality. He said, if you believe in him, you shall never die because the life of mortality is a life of sin and death. He said, but when you believe in me, you shall never die. That's what I'm saying. When the Bible talks about death, forget about the physical death. That's a transitional period. So if you are in Christ, you have an immortal life. And this is what exempts you from these things that's associated with this mortal life. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy, the chapter 1, the verses 9 to 10. We'll use it for our prayer point uh, this this night before we began. Can we go there? You look at it. That's why you see it. Gawuta ga nama fili fili. What Jesus brought to life is Gawuta ga what? Nama. Gawuta what? Ga nama. Praise the Lord. So that you can roast it. You can't say, oh, I didn't have fire. That's why I didn't roast this meat. You can roast this word in your heart. Look at it. He said, this is one of the reasons why Jesus came. He said, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. That means before the world began, God has already preordained this life of immortality for everyone that comes on this planet earth. That's what the Bible is telling us here. He said, who has saved us and called us on a holy call. So we, our calling was already prearranged before the heavens and the earth came into being. He said, but it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So this life that we have in Christ, the life of the Spirit, is now being made manifest because Jesus came. Who have abolished what? Death. And have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He has brought what? 
life and what immortality to what to light through what the good news of his gospel he has brought life and what immortality into display that everyone will know that there's a new life now that has been earmarked for man to live on this earth a life of immortality he's brought it plain now for you to know he has first and foremost abolished death and then now he unveiled or he rolled in a life of immortality and he has made it plain for everyone to know he said he that confesses my lordship i'll give eternal life and encapsulated eternal life is the life of immortality if you don't get this right in your spirit, that Jesus has abolished death in your life. If you don't get it right and has brought you into a life of immortality through the gospel and have complete understanding of it, Satan will always take advantage of you. You need to get this right. That Jesus has abolished death. He's not talking about physical death. He has abolished the foundation of stagnation, the foundation of continuous sickness, the foundation of oppression of the enemy. He has abolished all those in the foundation of what? Of your final damnation. damnation you were because of your great grandfather, my great grandfather Adam, who were now channeled into eternal damnation, into a lake of fire. But when Jesus came, he abolished that. And he brought us a new life. And what? A life of immortality. He made it play. And that's what. Same thing, I want you to know that you have a life of immortality. Am I the one saying it now? Have you seen it now? So I know all the time I've been saying some of you, are oh, what? This immortality? What is immortality? Immortality is something that is not diable. Is that not all? Can we understand it? It's what? Something that's what? Not diable. Something that is finite. It doesn't vacillate. Praise the Lord. It is the way it is from beginning to the end. It doesn't have corruption. Praise the Lord. It doesn't dwell in darkness. It's always what? In the light. Praise the Lord. That's why he is saying, the Bible says that, and have brought life and mortality to what? Light. He said Jesus was a light that lightens what? Everyone that comes on this planet earth. Is the light that lightens. Praise the Lord. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ before the world began. But it's now made manifest. So that life was given to you even before the world began. The life of immortality, but the life is now being made available because of the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Have an immortal life. I cannot hear somebody say that. Some of you still can't comprehend it. You have an indestructible life. That's the place you have been calling to. Praise the Lord. Sometimes when I see this in the Bible, I feel like howling and shouting. It makes me more confidence in what the Bible says, I am in Christ. It emboldens my faith life. It causes me to see with a different perspective, with the mentality, with the mindset of God. And it enables me to act like the way God wants me to act. When you understand what the Bible says, that's when you are empowered to act the same. We have been brought into a life of what? Immortality. Uncle Moses, do you believe that? You have been brought into a life of what? Immortality. Sister, do you believe that? You have been brought into a life of what? Immortality. Death has been dealt off with in your life. Get this right. Praise the Lord. Otherwise, Satan will take advantage of you and make, and make sure he draws your mind into the mortal world. Any time Satan takes advantage of you, all that he's doing is to draw your mind into the mortal world. Every time. Like the way the sister was questioning me, Satan has drawn her mind already into the mortal world. He begins to think like a mortal person, but you have been translated from that realm. You think the way God wants you to think. Praise the Lord. He draws you, your mind to a mortal world so he can easily 
you whenever you choose. Anytime Satan draws you into the mortal world, he slays you. All the people that have been slain control, Satan has already drawn them through their mind, through mental images, through his information, and he's made them to agree with them, and he brings them there. He will slay you. Every day you will become his back and call. Every time you allow Satan to draw you into the mortal world, he will slay you. You will become his back and call. Whatever he says is what you are going to do. All his bidding is what you are going to do. When he does this, you will do this. When he does this, you will do this. When he does this, you will do that. When he does this, you will do that. When he does this, that is, that is. What I mean to say that you become his remote control, a robot that he controls with a remote, whatever he wants you to do. Some of us, whatever we want to do, we just get up and we know that it's inconsistent with the word of God. We will do it the same. Until we do it, we will not be free. We will go and do it till you, are becoming, you become free. And you think you are free, you are not free. That's imprisonment. Because as long as you have done it, you think you are free, next time Satan will bring it again. And you will do it and you will be free. <laughs> That's not what we call freedom. It's slavery. Praise the Lord. Any time our faith comes alive on whatever our new identity is in Christ, brothers and sisters, our spirit of praise beyond this mortal world. Listen to this. If you never heard anything at all, listen to this, brothers. Anytime your faith comes alive, anytime your faith comes alive on what your new identity in Christ is, your spirit of praise beyond this mortal world. I say your spirit of praise what? Beyond what? Anytime you come in contact with faith and you begin to understand your identity in Christ. And that's what the devil does want you to know. The book of Philemon is only one chapter. The verse is that the communication of your faith might become effectual to the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. He said every time you come to a place when you begin to understand and begin to know your rightful position in Christ, the good things that God has given to you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he said your faith will be active and dynamic in this working. So when you know your true identity, you operate beyond the mortal world. Every time you come to acknowledge your true identity and function by the same, you will pray beyond the mortal world. We don't understand. That's where things are changed. That's where there are turn around. That's where you have things prospered for your life. If you believe that as a Christian, you are exempted from the liabilities of this mortal world as the Bible writer puts it, or of a certainty you will remain exempted. From these forms of liability that's associated with this mortal life and immortal world. Even this word that we are saying, this is just, just a short frame as compared to many things that have been said in the Bible. This is just a just minute fraction of the good news of the Bible. If you, if you hold on to this, I'm telling you, that mortal liability will, the exemption from mortal liability will work. If this thing should stay in your spirit, it will work. That's why many things hit me, I don't want to agree. No matter how. Because he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy when we hold on to it. Have you seen that? A more sure of what? Prophecy. When we do what? He said, the prophecy you have been going, let prophesy. I said, the word of God is more sure. If you hold on to it as a light that shines in darkness. He said, till the day star and the day down arise in your heart. He said, you come out of it. Hold on to the word. Hold on to the word. You have been brought into a realm of immortal. Hold on to it. Believe it. Let it become your contemplation. Do not allow the devil to draw you into the mortal world. By the way you think, by the way you begin to reason, he will don't go. All he's doing is to slay you. And not only slay you, he will bring you into a place of captivity and you become his back and call. When he does it, you will come. We can't whistle again. We used to whistle those times. Now we can't whistle again. Because I came to a time and said, oh, whistling, this whistling, well, whistling was not a good thing. Yes. You understand? What I do? It's not even coming. It's not coming. First, I could blow whistle here to call people from some places. Because we can't enter there. And I go to, what kind of whistle is this? Now, I can't blow the whistle anymore. 
not that I don't, I can't, I, I want to, I can't blow now. But how used to blow whistles then? Like whom have yes have listened? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so those of you who are still blowing whistles, you stop the whistles. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because you have been brought out. Hallelujah. And brought what? In. Praise the Lord. You know, God doesn't bring it out and leave us there. He brings us what? Out and brings us. The whistle should stop. Hallelujah. <laughs> it doesn't whistle like it doesn't work anymore. Praise the Lord. The power of Christ has taken that whistle because that whistle was not doing a good thing. Say <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> because if I could still whistle, you can still go and be doing the bad thing by using whistle. And, but now you, when you whistle, no one is going to hear you. <laughs> praise the Lord. You have to go feely feely. When you go feely feely, they will get to know. Oh! <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is merciful. If you remain exempted from all this form of mortal life, me that's associated with this mortal world and mortal world, your presence and status in Christ will allow you to operate in this new life. The life that's far superior to the law that governs the mortal life that you had before coming to know Christ Jesus. And this new law at work in you and me now is the law of the spirit of life or the law that governs the spirit life that you have now been born into. Because of your belief and confession of Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. Many, many Christians are bereaved of this idea. Many of us. Of the idea of our new life in Christ. And our new identity. And the power that this new identity possesses. We are bereaved of that. We are bereaved of this new idea. Of our new identity. And life in Christ. And because of that we are bereaved of his power to that we can want in order to overcome all the atrocities that are found in the mortal world. Praise the Lord. We now possess the spirit life. Tell somebody I possess the spirit life. And all this is because we do not take time to do diligence. That's why we don't know about our new identity. We need to take time to look. Do diligence study. Not just study, but diligence study of God's word. So we can come to that place where our faith life will always be alive on what the Bible says concerning our identity now in Christ. Look, a liability on the other hand is a debt or an obligation or a personal fraud that stands in one's way. When you talk about liability, it's a debt or it's an obligation or a, person, a personal flaw that stands in one's way. So what does it mean if it is said that one is, liability, one is a liability? If you say that someone is a liability, is someone or something is a liability, you mean that they cause a lot of problems and embarrassments. And no many children of God become a liability to the house of God. Are you aware? Too much embarrassment. Many. I become a liability to the house of God. So much embarrassment. I see some Christians sometimes and I look at them and I wonder whether they are, they are Christians. And someone will say, don't judge. I'm not judging, but you know, when I know them to be in the faith for quite a long time and experience that and, expect, and, I, and expect that there are things that they should go over, little, little things, and they don't go over it, it, it amazes me. Many have become a liability to the body of Christ. You want me to tell you why? The Bible even says it. That my name is blasphemed among the unbelievers because of what? My people. So God is saying that some of us have become liability to the body of Christ. He said, my name is what? Is blaspheme among what the Gentile because of what his people. He said the way we live among the people, we cause his name to be blasphemed. So we have become liabilities. Some of us. When I'm saying some word, I know what I'm talking about. When you see me saying something, I've stepped many on many scriptures. Like that's what I'm saying. So I say with that boldness. Many of us have become liabilities, the house of God. Liabilities. This of becoming what? Access. Praise the Lord. The Bible says we should become shining example that people can emulate. Praise the Lord. So they have become embarrassment. This means in this mortal life, there are a lot of problems and embarrassments associated with which all Christians are exempted from because of the life of Christ at work in us. In this mortal life, well, that we live, there are too many embarrassments. There are so many problems associated with it. 
too much. Too much. Too much problems. Who would have thought when Ukraine war started, another one also was start in the Middle East? Who would have thought so? Who would have thought so? And even when it started with the people in Gaza, who would have thought it would spill over to Hezbollah? Who would have thought so? And I don't blame people. I blame people who always will make, sit there and make analysis. Oh, Hezbollah has got 5,000. They have got quick, 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 quick. And they are not a nation. They are usurping somebody's nation, excuse me to say. They are taking, holding on to people, somebody's nation. It's on, their, it's on a nation. These people you are dealing with, they are a nation. And so if they are a nation, they are allowed to keep rear train soldiers and they are allowed to buy rear train equipment. If you are not a nation, you are just an army on your own, you can't buy certain equipments in the world. And, you, and unless you try to manufacture them, you don't have that... 100% know of all the equipment that is being manufactured on this earth. So when we were making that one, I said, hey, it's only one man I love what he said. The UN boss. He's got good dress. Good dress. When we were making that one, people were making that oh, and uh, overestimating Hezbollah. I said, hey, I don't want another Gaza in Lebanon. I ever told you that. I said, this man, he's only one seen between the lines. Long time. Late last year, he said, I don't want another, all oh, that you are over, all oh, that you are saying, oh, that's bola. he said, I don't want another Gaza there in Lebanon. It has happened now. Too much troubles. That the things that they put their confidence that could preserve them has not preserved them. If God doesn't protect you, brothers and sisters, nothing that man does will be able to, if you don't let them put all the bulletproofs on you, if the day comes out, the day of reckoning, you will go. Oh, it's true. You will go. So that's why I tell people that, look, it's better we put our mind off man and put our confidence in God. You will go. Hallelujah. If God doesn't build the city, he said the builder builds the city, but he builds it in vain. If God does not watch over a city, say the watchman that watches over the city watch but in vain. That means thieves can come and break in. If God doesn't help you build a city, no matter what amount you have, people have begun building, they couldn't finish it, and it's ended. And the house is still there now. Big, mighty, uncompleted, and they can't find, the family can't find money to be able to complete it. And they are selling it too because of the money and the confusion the family too. They are not being able to sell it. And the house is daily withering and the, my goodness, sometimes when I look at you, find that the whole world is full of nothing. It's a vanity upon vanity upon vanity upon vanity upon vanity. All is vanity. The world is full of troubles. If you continue to go to Iran, it's going to bring hardship now in the whole country. In the whole, it, it, they'll go and find their trouble and it will come and affect every one of us. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. God knows all these challenges that's associated with this mortal world. That's what I want you to know. I've drawn your attention here. That's the reason why he has called us out of this world and placed us in his domain that we might have life. That in the midst of the hopeless situation, we will have hope. In the midst of a hopeless, we will have hope. So we can live for him. Because we know that this world is what? It's a world that you cannot put your confidence on. The world is fallible. Is that the right word I can use? It's a fallible world. The systems are fallible. Everything about this world is fallible. Only the word of God is infallible. It stands. And when I look at the infallibility of God's word, I have no option but to grasp, hold on to that, take it as my food, make it my meditation, make it my mental image, cause my faith to come upon life on it so that I can function by the same and be able to live in the midst of the situation, in the midst of the challenge, in the midst of the problems. And I'll still find rest and solace in him that whether I die today, or not, I still live in him. When I die, I know that. Now, when I see those troubles and the bombings and everything, oh, I just say, my heart, I pray, 
most of them who will know Christ, their faith in Christ will rise again. That even in the midst of their death, oh, they have made life short for them. Praise the Lord. For to be absent of their bodies, to be present with the Lord. No, you when you go to somebody's city and you die. No. I want you die in the Lord. This is the biggest problem of the modern day church. How to believe and have confidence and complete assurance in what God says concerning our new life in Christ. That is the biggest problem of the modern day church. How to believe, how to have confidence and complete assurance of what is said concerning your life and my life in Christ Jesus. This is our biggest problem. How to hold on to those ways of life. How to be confident in what the author of life, your life and my life, the author of creation says, how to be confident in the same, how to hold on to the same, and how to receive power to function by the same as being a problem. To receive power to function by the same problem, but how to believe it, how to be, have confidence. When your confidence comes alive, power is added to the confidence. Anytime your confidence comes alive in the word of God, power is granted you, brothers and sisters. You don't need looking for power. It's just when your confidence comes alive, God backs you with his power. The three children, Hebrew children say, oh God, give us power to stand this fire. Oh God, give us power. They didn't say that. They said, simply, short, hear us, O oh king, we are not going to bow because we are not expected to bow before idols. We are the people who worship the living God. We will not bow. We don't need to think much about this matter. Do what you want to do with all humility. He said, do what you want to do, but we will not bow. If we perish, we perish. We say, we know our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, he said, we will not bow. Then we have a better place. They put the covert there. Did God put the covert? Is it covert? What you caveat. They put a caveat there. God didn't put a caveat there. They put a caveat. God didn't. God stood by his word. Every time I look at these simple examples in the Bible, it stirs my heart to rise up and to follow him wholeheartedly and to do the needful as his child. So even in the midst of the situation, in the midst of the challenges, I can still raise up my head and smile. Hallelujah. Not fearing what is coming. Whether tomorrow I'm going to die or tonight when I sleep, I'm going to die. That I'm sleeping peace because I know when I'm dead, I'm alive with him. Let that confidence be there in you. Live in a corner and have that confidence in God. Brothers and sisters, because if the world is burning on fire, your neighbor's house is burning, you don't know what is going to happen to your house. Fire is able to do what? To spread. As long as wind will blow it, it can spread. It can spread. So now I feel it for them, but I'll say again, you know, this to this afternoon when I was praying here, I'll say, Lord, I pray, not for the sake of those who know you in those lands, but for the sake of those who don't know you, I pray for preservation of life. They don't have opportunity. I know they have had opportunities and they have, but Lord, another opportunity, give them another opportunity that they will come to know you, that in the midst of this calamity, Lord, they will still stand with their heads tall. How many of us right now, if catastrophe should strike Ghana now, most Christians will be found wanting. We'll lose our faith, we'll lose our confidence. Some of us will sound and we'll say, oh, what is that? So if God, I knew you were going to allow me to go to, I wouldn't have served you. You've wasted my time. You tell God he has wasted your time. Because maybe something happened, your legs are broken now. A war came. Lord my God. The biggest problem of the modern day church is how to have confidence and complete assurance in what God says concerning our life in Christ. The modern day church has abandoned the faith life which is the pivot to our survival as Christians on this earth or in this mortal world. The faith life that has been given to us is the pivot to our survival, brothers and sisters, as Christians on this earth and in this mortal world. The faith life 
No wonder the Bible instructs us in this direction. Colossians 2, 6. It says, as you have received Jesus Christ, the Lord, so walk ye in him. And finally, before I close, Jesus also says something in Luke chapter 18, the verses 7 to 8. He said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Luke 18, 7 to 8. Are we there? Put it there. Luke 18, 7 to 8. And I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on this earth? From Jesus' own lips. He said, when he comes, the second coming. He said, will he find? He said, although God is ever ready to avenge us, but you know, when he comes, will he find faith? Faith that will cause your vengeance to be established. Can he find that? Your confidence in him that will let him express his vengeance for your life. Can he find that? Can he find that? You should tell us that as Christian, faith is the pivot for our survival in this mortal world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Where there are so many liabilities that makes it difficult for man to handle. There are so many liabilities in this mortal world. It makes it difficult for man to handle. Except by the help of a superior force. I said, except by the help of a, a superior force. There are so many liabilities that will make it difficult for us to handle. And the only way to get God who is the most superior among the forces of creation into our dire situation at any given moment in time is our confidence in what he says concerning any given matter. That's the only way to get God who is the most superior among all the forces of creation into our situation is to have confidence in what he says concerning any given matter. This is what the writer of Hebrews says in book 11, 11 Hebrews 11, 6. It's about for without faith it is impossible to place him. For he that comes to God should know that he, he is. And it's a reward of them that begin to seek him. We are getting to a last this. Brothers and sisters, many Christians don't want to hear this. You want to live here? I don't want to live here. Hallelujah. Even if Jesus doesn't come tomorrow, tomorrow, next or month, this next month, or next or next three years, or next four years, or next five years, next ten years, how sure are you that you'll be alive? The day you your your physical death comes in, your life is gone. Either you are going to eternity with God, or you are going to eternity in hellfire, your life is gone. So none of us can be able to put a finger. No wonder Jesus Christ said, Ha, huh, no one can know the time of his coming or the day, the end of the age. But they are all signs that he has shown us. The signs that he has spoken in the word of God. Every one of them is being fulfilled. Almost every one of the signs indicating the coming, the second coming of Christ Jesus is being fulfilled. Do you know the words that is going on down there in the, in the Asian country? How do you call it? That's Asian country. You know it's the Bible. Daniel said he saw stirring waters in that area, part of the world. In the book of Daniel. In talking about the end times, he said he saw what? Stead on what? Waters. Trouble. He called it what? Trouble. Waters. And he's talking about war. He said there was trouble. Waters there. Daniel said it. It's happened. You name it. Everything. Bible says now men have lost so much pleasure that they, do, they, they, they don't want to know about God. He said some have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They said they are Christian. If you talk that, God is saying that you have the power to resist him. Oh, you are the, oh. We have no one to run to, brothers and sisters. As of now, what is happening in the world there? They have no one to run to. Except God saved them. The world can't save them. You know, they were thinking... The higher powers will come to their aid. They are always speaking it. Every day speaking it on air. Cease fire, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. Where's without action? It's not going to work. And if they want to, they can do that. But everybody has chosen his or her side. Cease fire, cease fire. And behind the, behind the room, go ahead, go ahead. Every one of them, all the, all the functions, two functions. With their allies. Outward, they say, cease fire. Behind, they say, go ahead. 
There's no truth. That's what I want to tell you in this world now. And we live and we want to follow them. We are not going to, I'm not going to put my head as a, on somebody as a pillow, on a well institution or something. I'm never going to do that. The last thing I ever do to put my head as a pillow on man. God, help me. There's no truth anymore. Let's live our life for Christ. He's the only truth that we know. The only one who is able to secure us to the end. He's the only one. And he has given us his word. His word is what he uses as his personality to keep us and guide us on the pathways. Let's throw away this honesty. Let's throw away departure. Let's throw away all those things that is impeding our growth in the Lord. And let's love him wholeheartedly and serve him unreservedly. For the day is closed. Somebody bow down your head right now. I don't know what you want to tell the Lord right now. Somebody bow down your head right now. Don't sing. Somebody bow down your head. You yourself bow down your head now. And talk to the Lord. <coughs> Somebody speak to the Lord right now. All these things that we do after preaching is to get us aligned. If you don't do it, that's your problem. That's the power God has given to us. That's the medium God has given to us. As a medium for the move of his spirit. As a medium for his intervention in our situation. As a medium for his great protection or whatever we need him to do in our life. As a medium of steady anointing to give us power to say no or to do what we want to do. As a medium where he will allow angelic beings to come inside and minister unto us in the diverse ways. This is the time. Speak to the Lord, somebody. Somebody speak to the Lord. For there's a life of the Spirit in Christ Jesus at work in us. There's a law of the life of the Spirit in Christ Jesus at work in us. That law of the life of the Spirit of life which has been parted into a human spirit, is working. It sets you apart. It sets me apart from every form of liar, mortal liability. It brought us up to a place where we can reign and rule. Where we can function as present nature of God. Where we can walk in power. Power over sin. Power over weakness. Power over restlessness. Power over anxiety. Power. Power over lies. Power over dishonesty. Power over corruption. Power. Power. That's where we have been brought into. A realm, a domain of power. Where all things are made possible. To what? Because we believe in the same. For there's a place God has said he has brought us into and we are living there. Thank you. Somebody speak to the Lord right now. I just level some 30 seconds. Somebody speak to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness, your abiding love, and your grace. Grace granted us to stand. Every time there's a need to stand, grace granted us to run the race. With all confidence and with all assurance that because you are on our side, we will make it to the end. Nothing will stampede our progress. Nothing will stop us in our way, Lord, in our way of righteousness. Nothing will stop us. For truly, as we run, you are bringing us continually to that refreshing, rivers of refreshing that will refresh our souls, that will energize us and grant us strength again, renew strength to be able to carry on. And to keep on fighting. Thank you. Have mercy Lord over these nations. That are under this turmoil of the past of darkness. Mercy Lord. Have mercy on the people in Gaza. Have mercy on the people in Lebanon. Have mercy Lord. On the people in Israel. Have mercy. Have mercy Lord. Upon the people in Ukraine. Have mercy upon the, the people in Russia. Lord let your mercy prevail across the nations. And let peace come. For man cannot give peace except you give peace. Lord have mercy. Let your peace prevail. That the souls that are lost, Lord, will have the opportunity to confess your lordship. For many are dying in sin. And the devil is taking advantage of this. 
and causing wars and the wars, Lord, are spilling over. Father, we pray that your mercy will prevail. That every one of these warring factions will come to their senses, Lord, and come to the negotiating table and cease. Throw away their guns and look to you. It looks impossible, Father, as we crown to you, your mercy will prevail. You say we should not continue until our Lord's salvation burneth like a light. That's why we crown to you tonight. Have mercy. Have mercy upon God and let your mercy prevail, Lord. In Lebanon, let your mercy prevail in Israel. Let your mercy prevail in Ukraine. Let your mercy prevail in Russia. Let your mercy prevail across the nations. Every country that is thinking about starting any war again, Lord, we stop them in their track. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Enough is enough to these wars across the nations. Enough is enough. Lord, enough is enough. For there are many that need to taste of this kingdom that you have here, my, for everyone that calls upon your name. And I pray, Lord, that since as long as there's war, it will be difficult for many to come to this realm. I pray that's why we're calling upon you for this reason. Lord, that there will be peace prevailing so that people will come to know you. Those who have gone through this tribulation, gone through this war. I pray that, Lord, after the end of the war, they will come, many will come, recognize your sovereignty and your lordship, and give their life to you, that you might save them. Thank you. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you, King Jesus. About be on your feet right now, shall we sing this song? This is your hand. You rule and you reign. You rule and reign. My check is your name. on behalf of these nations and the turmoil none of them is free Israel is not free, Gaza is not free Hezbollah is not free, Lebanon is not free Russia is not free Ukraine is not free I beseech you by the message of God from tonight let us pray for them That's, I don't like listening to news but those news are anchors in my heart I know what is happening through scriptures that's why I'm following them if you read scripture you know very well about the end times let us pray for those nations hallelujah let us I know to have made up a passionate appeal to the Lord he will hear he will answer let's pray when we all rise up and we pray God will hear hallelujah and there's a reason why I, I got to have mercy that there are many lost souls there. Many who are here to hear the gospel. For their sake. For their sake. I know you might say these people are wicked. These people are dead. But for the sake of. In the midst of wickedness. There are some people. Whose hearts are still willing. And yearning to repent. And until we rise up as God's people. And cry. We will be selfish. And some of their blood will be required of us. From today, every week, lay down two days to pray. Pray for Gaza, pray for Lebanon, pray for Israel, pray for Russia, pray for Ukraine. Don't do any selection. If you are praying for any of them, pray wholeheartedly. And some of us say, This people are weak. You understand. But we need to pray. They don't know what they are doing. You might think they know. They don't know. If they know what they are doing, a child doesn't know how fire is, but they play with it. They don't know. Let's pray for them. And nestle from the depths of our heart, God will begin to make a change. And those that are even in the midst of that, those that are even in hardship, that they don't know what to go. God will touch them. They will begin. Jesus will begin to reveal himself to them. And many will give their life to Christ in the midst of this turmoil. Let's pray for the salvation of many. 
that God will have mercy upon the land.